Stoic tables are used by chemical engineers to keep track of every species as a function of the conversion. And this is a very important tool to have, especially when you have a huge reactor and you have many species present and you need to know the reaction conditions at a certain point in the reactor. So for example, if you had a plug flow reactor and you, were, you needed to know what concentration of species B was present at a particular point, if we assume we have a linear relationship um, in our conversion from the beginning to the end of the plug flow reactor, one could tell you, a chemical engineer could tell you using stoic tables exactly what um, concentration or molar flow rate of that particular species you have at that point. And so it's a very useful tool to have. Um, and so I thought I'd make this table to teach people about uh, how to create stoic tables along with how to actually use them to get what you end up, the, the final result. And so the stoic tables uh, are also referred to as rice or ice tables in general chemistry. Um, they are built entirely from the stoichiometry of the reaction, it has absolutely nothing to do with kinetics. Um, and the first step to forming a stoic table is to, first and foremost, and I cannot hit this home hard enough, make sure you understand with 100% certainty what the limiting reagent is. And you have to make sure you read the question or you fundamentally understand the initial conditions. And if you don't do that, you can end up doing a lot of work and get garbage. And so <laughs> before you start anything, just make sure you understand that you, what your limiting reactant is. And so to, uh, for an example, um, Pretend we have two moles of X reacting with one mole of Y to form one mole of C and one mole of D in a BSTR with N sub X equals 200 moles and N sub Y equal to 50 moles initially. At first glance, if you only looked at the first part of the problem, like I commonly do, uh, or if it's a midterm or a final and you're under stress and you only read the first few parts of this problem, you'll think that because you need two moles of X and only one mole of Y, X must be your limiting reagent. So that's a huge mistake to make, especially when it's part A of a multi-part question. <laughs> uh, so just make extra super duper sure you have read the question fully to understand that even though you need two moles of a certain species, um, does not necessarily make it the limiting reagent. In this example, because N why not is 50 moles, Y will actually end up being our limiting reagent. Um, this should say Y. Uh, so once you are certain that you have discovered your limiting reagent, you've fully read through the question, the next step is to um, actually start making a stoic table. And what I like to do is to normalize all of the stoichiometry coefficients based on um, your limiting reagents stoichiometric coefficient. In chemical engineering, we call stoichiometric coefficients nu. Um, this is the symbol nu, not v. Nu sub j, so j can represent a, b, c, d, whatever letter you want. Um, and so when we normalize it, if we take a reaction in which A moles of A react with B moles of B to form C moles of C and D moles of D, once we normalize it, the coefficient in front, in front of your limiting reagent A should now be one. And uh, the definition of stoichiometric coefficients is if it's a reactant, it will have a negative sign. If it's a product, it will have a positive sign. So in this equation here that I've written, nu sub A will be equal to negative one, nu sub B will be equal to negative B over A, nu sub C will be equal to positive C over A because C is a product, B and A are reactants, same goes for D. Um, an important thing to keep in mind while you are solving 
or creating a stoichiometric table is it is best practice um, and you'll avoid making a lot of mistakes if you stick with moles. And why is it important to stick with moles? Because if you're dealing with reactors such as uh, that, that change volume, um, if you work with concentrations or volumetric flow rates, it will give you problems later on because you are not keeping track of that. So rule of thumb, stick with purely the number of moles of each species in your reactor. And so in this example, I am building this stoic table based on this generic reaction here. Um, we have species A, B, C, D, and I. I is an inert species that does not um, have an effect. Uh, it does not undergo the reaction, so there is no change in it. So walking through this stoic table, we have the initial uh, m uh, number of moles of each species present in this first column or second column. In the third column, we have the change in the number of species of mole J, uh, species J, um, and that will be equal to, and notice the common theme here, N sub A naught times X sub A. This is why it is so important to make sure you have fully understood what your limiting reagent is before proceeding to actually making your stoic table. Um, and all this term is, is it's nu sub j, where nu sub j originates from our normalized stoichiometric equation, and uh, it has the appropriate sign, so because we are uh, losing moles of a and b as our reaction proceeds, we have negative signs, and we are gaining moles of c and d as the reaction proceeds, where they have positive signs. And then your final column is the number of remaining, which is simply equal to n sub j, uh, which is equal to n sub j naught, so the initial number of moles you start with, and these could also equal zero, commonly they're equal to zero um, for your products, uh, plus delta n sub j, which was this middle column here, so um, it's just a matter of adding them up. And um, this is the starting point from which we can uh, begin to derive the concentration of a certain species or a molar flow rate of a certain species at a particular um, conversion. And so the next step is to define something called delta value, or delta. And delta is defined to be the summation of nu sub j in our normalized equation. And so if we think about it, what delta is telling us is that for every mole of the limiting uh, reagent that reacts, what happens to the total number of moles of the system? So to think up a quick example, if we had one mole of A plus one mole of B reacting to form two moles of C plus three moles of D, the calculation for the delta value will be um, the following. So you would take the sum of uh, nu a, which would be negative 1, plus nu b, which would be another negative 1, plus 2, plus 3, and this gives us a result of plus 3. So what does this positive value tell us? This tells us that as moles of a react, as your reaction proceeds, we can expect the volume of the gas, we're assuming this, all these species are ideal gases, um, if they were fluids we wouldn't care about any of this stuff because fluids are incompressible. Um, the moles of the number of gas, uh, the number of moles increases over time so you will either have a volume expansion or a pressure and or a pressure uh, expansion or contraction and or a temperature variation as a result. We're assuming isothermal for the initial part of uh, reactor design class. So um, given this data, now that you know what your delta value is, um, to keep it generic, um, I am leaving it in this form so you can apply this to whatever reaction uh, you have, uh, the stoichiometry, stoichiometry you have.
Um, again, make sure this is coming from the normalized stoichiometric equation, otherwise you'll run into problems. Um, and so once you know what your delta value is, the next point is if you were working in a flow system and you wanted to determine, actually it's better to work, um, so ignore that. If we were working with a batch system in which we have a container with no flow in or out and you wanted to tell someone what the concentration of a particular species is um, given the conversion, you can do that quite simply by just dividing by the volume. And this is very nice if your volume is constant, but when you're dealing with a BSTR in which there's an ideal gas reacting and the moles are changing, your volume is, uh, can be a function of X. And so when that is the case, what do you do? And so what we do is we, have, we are using the ideal gas law and we are um, taking an adaptation of it. It is still the ideal gas law, but it tells us that the final volume over the initial volume is equal to the initial pressure over the final pressure times the final temperature over the initial temperature times the number of total moles in your system at the end of the reaction divided by the number, or actually this is n sub t as a function of x. So that's not necessarily at the end of the reaction. It is defined um, at a particular conversion um, and then divided by the number of, to number of uh, moles total initial. And um, so this NT naught would take into account everything here, including the inerts. Uh, and then NT takes into account everything here. And you'll notice that it is a function. So when you sum all these up, they are a function of the conversion. So that's what we want. And so we can further simplify this um, based on this relationship if we define a new variable called epsilon. Um, epsilon is referred to as the limiting uh, contraction or expansion. And epsilon is defined to be the, uh, this y sub a naught tells us what the initial molar ratio is. So it's a dimensionless number um, and it is constant times delta value. So the delta value you calculated up here. It is important to note that delta is also a dimensionless number, so epsilon must also be dimensionless. Um, and from this relationship here, we can solve for, a t um, for our volume as a function of x sub a. And when we do that, um, we get this relationship. V naught can be anything. You're usually given it or you can solve for it. Um, P naught over P will equal one if it's an isobar. And typically in chemical engineering problems, if it's, it, it will be an isobar because um, if it's not an isobar, it's likely to be an isocore, in which case your volume will equal V naught and all this extra stuff is just pointless. So this is very typically equal to one. Um, T over T naught would take into account if this was not an isotherm, but it is, so that term is also equal to 1. But I'm leaving it here so we have the overall generic equation. Um, and then we add, uh, multiply these other terms by 1 plus the initial molar ratio of your limiting reagent times delta value times X sub A. And so why is that important? Now that you've defined your volume as a function of X sub A, determining what your concentration should be, right here, is now possible. So we plug this volume value in here, and you can tell someone now what the concentration of species J is for all species given um, the rate of conversion of your limiting reactant, assuming it is named A. Um, it is very common to call the limiting reactant A. It's best practice, and uh, I hope this was useful to you guys. Let me know if you have any questions, and thank you for watching.